You gotta understand the enemy's not the man, it's the mindset. Killing my people to send a similar to COVID. No sense. How you take a life without a motive? Tired to see in protest, I ain't to see progress. For the person that'll win in the end, doesn't really matter what's the color of the skin. When the bullets scatter, when they bleed from within, haven't we shed more blood than these So I think in, in, in talking about racism, um, it's it's an issue that's just, it's, it's there, it exists. You know, we can't say we don't see it. It's, it's, it's right in front of us. Um, just, just last night, my sister who lives in Pennsylvania now was pulled, pulled over um, out in Ontario. And, and, was, and was said that uh, there was a string of robberies in the, in the area. Um, and, and, and she got out the car um, and, and they were just, they were talking, it didn't really escalate, but you know, she was really upset about it. Um, and it, it made me, it made me upset. You know, it's like, who am I? Like, are they going to know me? I, I got to thinking that, like, you know, I felt like, you know, if they know me, it's not going to be a problem. Like, you know, oh, Damien, how you doing? And it's going to de-escalate, you know? And, it, and sometimes it's a matter of like, who you know? But the sad thing is, is like that, that happened to her last night and it hurt her badly. I called the police department, you know, right after it happened and asked like, is, is this, is this a real thing? Like, has there been break-ins? And they say, yeah, it has been. And, I don't know. It was just a, it was just an, I don't know. It bothered me. It bothered me, you know, like right here, right here in, in my town. Um, um, before, uh, you know, Cheryl kind of ended up talking what she was t talking about. I thought about what was said about my son. So um, my, my son's aunt spoke um, about him and his life as a young black man. And, and how she said, like more than anything, she wants him to succeed. Like, she wants him to prove everybody wrong. And Cheryl was even touching on that, like, and his mom said, you know, I think said it best, like, I don't want him to have to prove everybody wrong. Like, he should just be able to be a kid. He should just be able to live his life and do good. Like, not, not, that, not that he has to prove, you know, somebody wrong. Like, all the people that look at him, you know, as a, as a statistic, like, like that, that is an, is an issue, you know, and, and these kids growing up, my kid, your kids, you know, it, it shouldn't have to be like that. You know, they shouldn't have to, to, to live up to some standard. And I think Cheryl was touching on that. Like, you shouldn't have to live up to some standard, you know, like, just be a kid, live your life. You know, it's, why, why does he have to worry about that, you know, at, at, at this age? He's 14 years old. Why does he have to worry about that? Racism it exists, you know, and what can we do as a community to kind of, to break that cycle. What can we do as a community to break the cycle of racism? Please share personal stories, you know, what, what you see as, um, what, what, you, what you see that can help, help change, change that. I think you guys said it earlier, the concept of relationships. You know what I mean? I'm, <clears throat> I wouldn't have left Ashland with the good feelings I had to return from California to come back to Ashland if it weren't for the prior relationships I had with people that were from Ashland. You know, the Scott Harris, the Skip Madison, just some just two names of people that taken me in and done been super instrumental in my time at Ashland and who I've become. And so I think it's you know making sure that you're not afraid, A, look in the mirror and if you have a belief or be able to confront something at home, that that's that's step one, being able to confront whatever whatever racism lives within you or within we all have some evil beast inside of us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And being able to confront those and then going out and being brave enough to ask questions, where am I wrong? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I did this. Was this right? Was this wrong? Like, I hear so many people in the last few weeks of saying, hey, I haven't said anything because I'm scared of saying the wrong thing. Mm. Yeah. You can't be corrected if you don't say anything. Right. 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 You know what I mean? Like, you can't have that opportunity, that, that moment of growth. Yeah. If you don't say, say the wrong thing. Yep. Let's let us know that you're trying something. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Because I think all the black people here would agree, I'd rather see something than nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? If yeah. I can have that dialogue with you and I know that that's what it's going to be, and not just, it's not just a piss and match back and forth and yeah. someone's trying to prove their idea is right or whatever the case may be, yep. but I know we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, then that changes the whole game. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Then we can build a relationship off of that. Yeah. And if we already have a prior relationship, well, then you should feel really open to say something and just trust that I will want to teach you as opposed to just belittle you. Absolutely. You know what Absolutely. I mean? So I think the first thing is just, you know, being willing to take that step. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so many people are scared to be called racist right now. Yeah. Oh, it's terrifying. It, it's, it's, it, yeah, <laughs> and I, mean, I, I get it. It's real. It's, like, especially being white. I mean, you're, you, get, 
I mean, even tonight, I was like, God, I hope I don't say the wrong thing. And it's not even, it's not that my heart is not in the right place. It's just, I don't know. You worry about saying the wrong thing and it being taken or misconstrued the wrong way. Absolutely. You know? I, was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I think it's really helpful if, for white people if you can decouple the racist shit you do from the person that you are for a second. If I think about the fact that I have blue eyes and you ask me to change my eye color, I'm screwed. I can't do that. But if, you, if I'm able to say I am a good person that does racist shit every once in a while because I'm, I'm an evolving human being, I can work on that. Like that's a behavior I can modify. That, at this point, it becomes equal with I drink too much or I drive too fast. Like it's a behavior, I can work on it, you know? And, and I know that Cheryl's relationship with me started five years ago when we had, we were holding an event and, and the rules were really clear, it was a political event and there was a person that wanted to be in that event and they happened to be a person of color. But the way that the event was, was set up, it was for the nominee from one party and the nominee from another party, but it, we hadn't thought about a third party candidate. And so I politely, this is five years ago, told this lady, you know, I, I'm sorry, you can't be in the event. And she, you know, she decided in that moment in my, based upon my behavior that I was racist and I was stunned because I grew up in a family that was, that wasn't my, I didn't, that wasn't how I was built. Right. So I, I panicked and I called Cheryl and I said, I, I'm, I swear to God, I said that I need to talk to a black person. I need to talk to him right now because I don't understand what is happening here and I need you to help me understand it. And she helped me understand the fact that like, if the metaphor was I was in a room with this person, I saw myself and the person in the middle of the room and we could move freely in that negotiation, almost, almost, almost dancing. Cheryl showed me that that wasn't exactly where that person was starting out her view of the relationship that we had was she was in the corner and the only way out was through me. And when I had that realization, it changed things. And I think that like, to your point, you have to, for white people, it starts with some humility. Just, just accept the fact that you don't know and you have work to do because you're part of it. Right. <laughs> So I mean, I, I, it doesn't I mean you're bad. That, it just means you're part of it. Do you know the miles theory? This idea of where you sit determines where you stand, how you understand that. And I think that idea of where I sit then determines where I stand in the community. And if I'm sitting in a sense of, you know, it just, it's like it changes everything. And even the idea of like something I learned in a webinar earlier this week with some folks of color talking about the idea of the word minority you know, of how that word in my culture describe, and it's like, no. And so I'm trying to retool my language. It's, you know, you know, I'm not even quite sure, black, African-American person of color, as opposed to saying a minority, because when I say minority, that by just the fact that I'm a white person saying that, I've already put them at a lesser place at the table. And I think it's that element of, uh, and, and it goes to, uh, Brene Brown has a book out called Dare to, Dare to Lead, and She's a sociologist and she's done a lot of work on the concept of shame. And I think that's the thing we all sort of work through. But this idea of, are we willing to risk to say, I have a racist tendency, you know? And, and, and in saying that, that you'll receive that well. And she talks about the idea within the workplace of being able to rumble, where I give you permission and you give me permission in our relationship that we're gonna try to work this thing out. But the problem in our culture today is we're so connected through technology that that's taken away this. You know, we don't have our front porches. We don't have the engagement in the communities that we need to have in order to have these kind of hard conversations because it matters. You know, so, I, Elijah, I don't know if you, we've, we've known each other for a while now, yeah. you know, and yeah. it feels like the two things are connected, mm -hmm. right? 
you know, like race and our, racism, the, the racism in the system, mm. you know, like our individual hearts are in our, our control, right? Mm. You know, like we've known each other. And so mm. we trust and respect one another, mm. but it doesn't change the fact that we're in a system that's 400 years old. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it's, I think for white people, it's kind of a cop out sometimes to say it's like fully a heart thing because in 1955, people, black people, your, your ancestors, they, they couldn't drink, they couldn't use a water fountain. They couldn't use it. That was like, they changed the system to make it so people, the only reason, you think hearts did that? I don't think hearts did that. I think legislation did that. I, I mean, I think people activated, maybe their hearts activated their brains. Well, but that's that's part of the process. So even you know, this friend I, I mentioned I just, in Grand Rapids, he talked about, um, you know, that it was the men that allowed women to vote in 1919. It wasn't the women, they did the suffrage movement and that, I hadn't even thought about that. And it's like, okay, so then that what that means is really we have to use our influence as white men in the community to say to our public leaders, because it is connected, but systemic, because we always want to go to politics to solve the problem. And we've made something po of politics that's not meant to be. I mean, it, it is so far beyond what the original founders intended. Yeah, it may, it may, it becomes political, but what if um, there are some institutions out there that are part of government that could enact certain policies or certain in initiatives? You know, I, th I think it does become political naturally, as everything does. But, um, you know, last, I think our, our last talk we were talking about, I was talking with, 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 with Jeff, and I just have the hardest time dealing with, you know, the George Floyd death and how the other cops didn't act. And what is it in the system? Right. It's, and I've come to find out there is something there. There's something in the system that prevents, I don't know if you want to call them good cops, but prevents cops from stopping a bad cop from doing something that's racist or that's just wrong. And to me, I feel like that is a systemic problem because they're the good cops that would have stopped them, they get blackballed and they get they, they get out of the system. Okay, you're risking my job. You gotta go. Right. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's not so much that, I don't think everything is like political, but this is the system we're in. We have, we, we elect leaders, we elect people to sort of solve these, these problems for us. And they've, they've, they've gotta be at the, this, this, this table. Right, right. They've, yeah. they've got to, have courage because a lot of them feel, mm -hmm. a lot of them feel the way that we feel, but they don't have the, the courage to to it's like right to speak word. out. Yeah, they just the they right they word. they just they just don't have it. So, or is it afraid to like ruffle? Or to yeah, like well they don't it, they don't want to ruffle feathers. The, right. the, the 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 police chief doesn't want to ruffle the feathers of the police union or his fellow cops right. or the mayor or whoever. So it sucks that it's that intertwined, that politics is that intertwined, but that's the system that was built, you know, from a hundred plus years, years, years back, you know? Um, so it's not just, oh, I'm a, I'm a good person or I've got a good heart, but if you're in an elevated position, you've, you've got to take action. And you've got to deal with, unfortunately, being, a, being a, alienated to a certain degree. Well, you that's know? that risk. That's that courage to lead that yeah. Brene talks about. And risking that, knowing that you may get shut down. You may have to find a new social group. Yeah. yeah. Those, are, those are real. You know, but that's really what this is all about. That's what it boils down to. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's political. Um, cause we talk about systemic, I mean, politics are ingrained in our lives, you know? So we talk about defunding the police, you know, that right. you go into black lives matter. One of the first things right. they pitched you with was defund the police. Well, we talk about the education piece. 
what does defund the police mean? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? No one's talking about that. They're right. saying, oh, no, we just want to get rid of the police and have a lawless system, anarchy. Right. <laughs> who, who wants who, that? Who wants that? Right. You know, that, that's, that's not saying you, but like, no, you know, we, we, you know, we don't know. No one's taking the time to look. They're talking about, let's take some of the funds away. The New York City Police Department, I believe, budget was $6 billion. Yeah, it's crazy. $6 billion. So when they say, hey, we're going to take some of that away and put it towards some mental health aspects. You know, people are saying, we don't need the police to show up to a, a drunk guy asleep Sleep in his in car. His car. Right. Yeah. We need an EMT. We need yeah. a mental health service. We need someone that doesn't, that's not going to first instinct is going to show up with a gun and tase him. That's what they're saying. Like, we need to put that money in other areas that can better serve the community that we're putting the cops at a disadvantage as well. They're yep. not trained for these things. They're not trained So for guess that? what? You right. put someone who is untrained in the situation, give them a gun, and they're nervous. Mm-hmm. Who in here wants to be around anyone that's nervous with a gun, regardless of your profession? Right. You know? And they're just people. They're people who passed the test. They went through some right. training. Right. They're people just like me and you. Yep. You know what I mean? I, I don't want their job, but guess what? Some of them, when they get in certain situations, they don't want their job either. Right. Right. And that's... They're, they're scared at times. You know what I mean? But guess what? That means it's a situation they probably shouldn't be in. So when we talk about defunding the police. We're not saying get rid of our entire police force. We're that's saying, the first thing people hear. That's the first thing. That's the, oh god, Black Lives that's Matter. That's priority. That's state. yes, and that's, And I really we, love the we, fact that you went to the word empathy mm-hmm. because that's really where part of this is too, in terms of influence and how do I, as a man of uh, a white man in my community, as a pastor or as a leader, how do I lean into that, but also have empathy to know, okay, we've got to figure this thing out. Well, and it takes empathy to want to learn. Yes, right. That's that's the big one. If you don't want to educate yourself or educate your kids or, or be have the courage to stand up and educate your coworkers or whoever those may be, well then this whole thing's for not. You know what I mean? You're, you're a part of the problem now. Yeah. That's, you know, and so understanding that having empathy is a good thing. You know, it's a needed thing right now. Um, that's one of the first, but you gotta be able to do that, you know, and just look at the big picture and not look at, oh, we wanna be able to have such instant gratification and believe we know something right away from a headline. Mm. The amount of people that scroll Facebook and think they have a topic mastered you know what I mean? Wherever your news source may be. And if you're getting all of your news from Facebook, God bless you. Um, but we, we yeah. Know, we know something about that, don't we, Larry? <laughs> you know, <laughs> people read you guys as headlines and think they read the whole story, right? And it's, there's, there's context to these things. Thank you. Yeah. And, and until people are willing to take the time to understand context, it's, it, the road will remain long. Right, but part of it is we want to make life easy. Yeah. And it's not supposed to be. No. It's supposed to be about hard work and, and industry, and that's what we've, we've built the nation upon. The problem is that we've used the system, if you will, when I think about 354 years before we got to the Civil War, and I actually think this is another sort of, in my days from, from hanging out with a bunch of political scientists, that this is another realignment, if you will, in, the, in our nation's fabric. I mean, again, America is still, it is still, and compared to everything else, it's an amazing, as Ronald Reagan said, a city, you know, shining city on the hill. It, it's imperfect compared to lots of things. But on the other hand, it's still where people want to come. And we, it's, it's also a very fragile thing as we're coming up on our, our 4th of July. You know, it's, it's this idea, it's a republic. It's not a democracy, it's a republic where we put people in charge to govern for us with good hearts, we hope, and good minds, but sometimes they don't. And we have to be more uh, intentional about who we put in these offices. Right. That's, that's such a big thing, you know? like. Um, who our, our local councilmen are and who our mayors are. Uh, it starts, people get all in throes and, and a bunch about the presidency. You know, who voted for Sherrod Brown? Um, who, you know, whatever, who was your local guy? Who, you know, who, who did you vote for and why? You know what I mean? Like, are they helping the policies that we believe need change? You know what I mean? When that becomes a collective effort, you know, then we're able to do that. And people got to get out and vote. I mean, I know it's like, oh, my one vote doesn't change. It may not change the presidency. I get it. Electoral college, and most people don't even know that that exists. Um, but your one vote matters on a local level. And most John F. Matter- Kennedy won by one vote per precinct across the country. And Sarah talked about that. We touched on it in the barbershop the other yeah. day, like voting, voting locally, how much it matters. And- <laughs> Huge, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, people just think of the president, and they don't think of everything else, because that's where you're going to see change. You can't. You're not going to change it right now with, with Trump. You're going to change it within your, your city and your state. That's where you're going to start. You, you have to start small to, to go big. All politics so, is local. Yeah. So you have to start within that. You have to do your research. Young people, very guilty of not, we, we are the majority of the state, but we are the lowest number of voters. Why do you think, think that is? 
I mean, I don't know if it's a lack of unseriousness. I, I don't know if it's just young people think that it's they're defeated instantly like it doesn't matter like you said like that one vote's not going to matter um i don't know also if it's i i think personally in in ashland um for me it's kind of boring mm -hmm. you know we're, we're spoiled it's all if it's not technology if it's not cool we're not doing it and i think that's where it's at i think yeah. politics Mike, are boring you said you're from canada what's the what's the perception do you think What's the perception, Canadian perception of what's happening in the United States right now? Do you have a, a handle on what that might be? Yeah, I mean, my family and friends are all there. Every time that we talk as recent as today, uh, it's just super divided. I think that would be their perception of us, that we're super, super divided down here. On, 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 every, on every level. On every level. I agree with that. That's one of the things I spoke to Roy Shoulders, and um, we were talking about the the impact of social media on what's happening right now. And and I was telling Roy, I thought I think it's just making it worse because everybody thinks, you know, oh the house across the street's on fire. You know, it it, it brings everything right to you. Mm -hmm. And Roy turned me around like that. He goes. Are you telling me you're uncomfortable, Larry? And I said, absolutely. He goes, good. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. You know, and, and I just love when somebody spins it on me like that, you know, it makes me think completely different way. You know, and, and that's what I kind of wondered if, you know, the perception that they're seeing in Canada is that the house next door is on fire, you know, and, and it sounds like that that is the perception. Yeah, and I mean, the way I was raised, uh, people would always make fun of the fact that we really don't even have a military. Yeah. We always expected the U.S. to defend us. But we would have sort of been raised the other extreme. You know what I mean? If there's extremes uh, the other way, we were probably considered that. So this has been a learning experience even for me. I've been here now 20 years. But trying to learn and to try to understand this deep-rooted hate, and my nature is... I, I'm not just a let's all point out the problem. Uh, my nature, my personality is I want to be part of the solution. So, you know, sometimes I I want to go quick to tell me the three things, the five things, like when I hear Jay talking earlier, like tell me where to start. You know what I mean? Like what do I need to do to help? Because I would say this, I've just been listening tonight, but I do think that there is a fear of saying the wrong thing. I have said probably what some would consider too much the last month or two and have have received feedback for that. Uh, I'm also on 11 church boards around America and multiple pastors have reached out to me this week where some of their staff has resigned effective immediately because of the post that either they thought too much was said or not enough was said. And so I think if we're honest, uh, there's an element of that if, and it, it's going to depend for everyone. So I'm not a police chief. I'm not a mayor. I'm a pastor. Uh, but whether you're a business leader or fill in the blank, there's an element of if you are putting yourself out there and you could lose half of your clientele or half of your business or your staff or whatever it is, by nature, some people are going to shrink back. And, and be like, I can't, not coming out of coronavirus and everything else going on, I, I can't, I just can't do that, Micah. Uh, but when I'm hearing pastor talk about being uncomfortable, I think we have to, I think we have to. We, we, you know, I love what Reggie was saying was, even if it's the wrong thing, we appreciate you saying something. And, and I, I heard my friend say, there's a black pastor in Baltimore and, and uh, Jimmy made the statement the other day, he said, Everyone says they want to be a bridge builder right now, but you have to understand if you build a bridge, you're going to be walked on by both sides. And that was really helpful for me that both sides are going to walk on you. Um, so I still want to build a bridge. Um, so I appreciate all the, the stories and stuff being shared, both in these sessions and last week. It's very helpful, uh, very helpful to me, hopefully, to do something. I think what Sarah said earlier, same thing for me. 
I was like, God, I hope I don't say the wrong thing tonight. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, but like Reggie said, if we don't say anything, then we're not raising yeah. the level of conversation. Yeah. yeah. You know, so when we've got to find a, yeah. we've got to find a place where There's we can so talk. so many different you know? like feelings too, because it's like, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to say nothing. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. Well, I'd like to um, piggyback off something I heard Pastor Chad and Pastor Micah mentioned before. It's like being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay, we take that step and then we build a relationship. Mm -hmm. And then we gain an understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can really change. You know, we just got to understand each other. We want y'all to feel our pain and we want to feel y'all pain. And at the end of the day, we want to help. Because like I said earlier, we can pick a side, but we all got, we all got something in common. And that's, our, we're going to die. And we got to answer to one man, one spirit. And that's when it's too late. So let's not wait till we got to be at the gates, ready to get judged. Let's just change it now. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Simple as that. Spread love, not hate. But I love that. Be comfortable with, you know, being uncomfortable because we can get somewhere like that. Well, it gets better over time too. Right. You know, I mean, you, you get better at getting called on your BS. You, you learn, you get, you get a thicker skin, you know, when, when a person of color who's your friend says, man, that was, you got to improve, you know, and, and the first time it's like, Oh, I'm melting. Yeah. You know, but the 174th time, you know, it, it, it's, yeah. it's easier, you know, and, and I think that's, that's what's incumbent upon white people is to, is to step into that uncomfortableness and, and find people that can talk to you in, as friends. And what ends up happening is that you end up making friends. Like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's not like a damn miracle. I mean, it just happens, you know, and then all of a sudden you're surrounded by people that are your friends, your allies. And now you're doing, you're doing what Damien's doing tonight. You're building things that, that build on themselves. And that, that's what's just, but it is incumbent upon white people to step into that. It's on us. I mean, you know, our race built the system. So it is on us to step into it and start to look at what parts of it get dismantled or changed so that, Sense of so that we take, can all take ownership. Own. Yeah, it's just part of being just taking ownership. And I loved what, so I've never, I'll be honest, I've never heard anyone share the $6 billion philosophy you were sharing about, we just want this, we wanna add this, team approach, they're not qualified, these people, like that was actually brilliant because maybe it is my mind want to, wanting to think solutions, but I can see that very clearly. Like when I'm hearing Reggie share that, you know, I, I dealt with a suicide this morning. We have two morning services after the first service. They're like, you got to come right now. The husband didn't even know yet. I got there and it was horrible. Kids are involved. And so paramedics are there. Uh, a counselor was there, a coroner or police. And honestly, I felt like everyone was playing a role. Uh, you know, I'm holding the husband and the dad, weeping. You know, they're ever, all of those people are doing their things. Um, but it was almost like I was putting that when I was hearing Reggie talk, like if we could somehow get to a team approach, like we don't need one person to fix everything. I can't fix everything. Like one person cannot fix everything, but if we could have moments like this, if we could have moments with the system, where what can you change? You know what I mean? What can Micah do? What can Jay do? What can Sarah do? And believe that together, together we can make a difference. 